Hey class, this is the video lecture for March, uh, Tuesday, March 31st. Um, before I get into the lecture, I just wanted to say I got a bunch of the emails from you guys about Thursday's ad analysis presentations. Again, um, you don't have to record the video if you don't want to, it's a personal choice. If you wanna just go live and do it there, um, as one of the other students did for the media monitor, you can do that as well. Um, and if you haven't emailed me, just come on the live session on uh, Thursday. That's on, you go to week eight. Um, it's April 2nd, and then you'll see the live Q&A. You'll join there, and you don't send me anything. I'll just grade you like if we were in class and I'm writing it down. Um, so looking forward to that. If you have any questions or want me to look at it, please send it to me as soon as you can to my Gmail. Um, that way you can get the full grade and you can make the changes. Um, do not send it to me Thursday morning. That's not going to work. Um, so let's get into the lecture. Let me share my screen. All right. So, um, yeah. Sorry, I'm pausing here because there was a meme that I saw on Instagram that I want to show you guys, but I'll show you guys at the end. All right, so today we're continuing chapter seven, Potter, uh, Mass Media Content Part Two. So let's recap uh, last week's class. Um, formulas are used by media producers to create messages and by audience to understand them. The most general formula is the next step reality formula, which um, adds reality and fantasy in a way that draws you in. Messages with the same type of formula are called genres. The, narr the narrative genre has three main types, which we learned last class, informing, persuading, and entertaining. Um, this is used primarily to elicit emotional response. If we hear a joke, <coughs> excuse me, if we hear a joke, this will give us, um, this will give laughter. An emotional scene will give us sadness and tears, we'll cry. A scary scene will make us jump. A movie with a long journey will give lots of different emotions. So what's a movie that gives you lots of different emotions? Um, I had my Mass 1 class. They had a choice to watch The Shawshank Redemption. I think that's a good movie that will have a lot of range of emotions. Um, what are some other ones? So when we look at popular music, songs, or even styles may seem completely different, but they all follow a set of formulas. They are built from a limited number of notes in a standard sequence. Um, before I show you the example, there's another example. I listened to a lot of reggaeton, Spanish reggae rap music. Um, and recently they've been reusing old hip hop or old reggaeton songs in the beat. And it just so doesn't sound good. Um, and it seems like I think one song was popular and they keep copying it. And it's just, there it was a whole article that they're not being original and they need to change that. But the most popular example, which we'll see here, <laughs> All right, that was a little corny <laughs> with the birds. I'm 
So is this trend still happening? I don't know. Um, why don't we listen to a lot of pop songs? Um, and it's also why you hear a lot of the same types of sounds and beats in rap music. So why does this happen? Why do the songs all sound the same? Don't we want different, different sounds? Um, actually, they did a survey here that says the more we hear the same type of sound, the more popular it becomes. And songs that change that sound become less popular. People are in tune and not to listen to them. Um, and I've linked this. Again, if you couldn't really see that video, I've linked all that. And I've linked articles that you may want to read that I'm skimming on um, and so forth. So this can be said for any message. Um, there's copying styles and things like that. So there's a general story formula. Let me move my head. It's in the way again. Screenwriter Sue Clayton was commissioned, commissioned by Diet Coke to determine a formula of successful movies. Diet Coke wanted to see if there was a formula they could tie in to see what movie was going to generate the most money so that they could uh, sponsor that movie or place ads in that movie or for that movie. So Sue Clayton, she's a professor, I think, in London. This is the formula that she came up with. And this, these movies have done really well. It has to have 30% action, 17% comedy, 13% good or evil, 12% love, sex, romance, and we'll see even in kids' movies that it has love, 10% special effects, and 10% plot. Oh, and lastly, 8% music. There has to be some kind of singing or soundtrack to it. So in a discussion, can you name a movie that has all of this? And you can't use the examples that, I meant, that I'm about to mention. So the most, can you guess what the most popular one is? One of the sequels just came out, I think, last year. So Toy Story 2. Toy Story 2 has all of these elements, I guess. Woody is in love with Bo Peep or whatever. Who knows? Um, and here's an interesting story here about Toy Story 2 almost got deleted. Um, when the movie was done, somebody entered a command into the system and it wiped out 90% of the movie. Luckily, one of the, off, one of the directors or editors had backed up. Um, the backups didn't work, but somebody who was working in the movie was pregnant and working from home and her home computer backed up. If not, we wouldn't have Toy Story 2, probably Toy Story 3 or 4. So it's an interesting article. Um, Titanic fits all of that that formula and it was the most expensive film made at the time it cost 200 million titanic made 1 billion um and later grows 2 billion in total with the tapes one memory of titanic uh everybody in my family had the tapes we did a road trip to florida and the car had a vcr player and we were amazed so we would just watched titanic over and over and once you got halfway through you had to take out the tape put the other one all right moving on so certain characteristics these, uh, these films must have in order to appeal to audiences. So besides that formula, they have to have certain characteristics. They all must begin with a conflict and problem. That conflict and problem is later heightened throughout the story. Characters must try to solve the problem. I think, you know, in Toy Story 1, uh, or I think in every Toy Story, the guy's moving or something, they get rid of the toys, whatever. Um, and there's a climatic scene where everything is resolved towards the end or, or at the end. This formula is not only used by producers, but is used by us to recognize good and the bad guys and what is going on in the story. Messages that follow the formula closest draw the biggest audiences. We are already conditioned for certain plot points, pacing, characters, and themes. But producers cannot follow the formula to a T or it'll be boring. They, keep, they have to mix it up a little bit. Maybe the plot's in the beginning, maybe the, the main thing is in the, in the beginning and so forth, excuse me. So we're gonna talk about the traditional genres of movies and shows. So the first one is a tragedy. Characters are either good or bad. Bad things happen to them. There is a fatal flaw or character or fate is against them. We like to compare ourselves to try the characters and feel better off than those unfortunate events. So as I mentioned these genres, can you guys give me some examples and discussion of what comes to mind for some of them? And when we look at tragedy movies, we have a list of a bunch of them. Titanic, which I would, yeah, I guess, yeah, it's a tragedy, but a love story, Schindler's List. I don't know what that is. Gladiator. Uh, Requiem for a Dream is a very good movie. 
if you're looking for something to watch, I definitely recommend it. It's a little vulgar and grotesque, but you should watch it. Hachi, if you want to get those emotions to cry, watch to the end. Um, so these are all tragedies. I don't know. I wouldn't ca clarify some of these as tragedies. All right, moving on. So mystery movies or mystery genre for the shows. Um, important part of the plot is withheld until the end, and there's a big wow moment, right? So I don't know if you guys know this gif. This, there's the whoa moment at the movie. Um, yeah, I love that gif. Anyway, moving on, that's when the wire. Um, there's crime. There's suspense and solving puzzles. What are some mystery genres or um, mystery titles? Um, I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the movie, and I should have Googled it before I started this. The movie where the kid can see ghosts and Bruce Willis, and at the end, he's a ghost. And if you haven't seen it, sorry, I ruined it for you. That's one of them. So the action horror. Um, it's primarily plot-driven. We have good versus evil, and they fight in a conflict. The characters are stereotypes or char comic book characters. Right away, we know who's good or evil, such as the Fast and Furious movies. You know the good guys are driving the cool cars or whatever. Um, it's fast-paced action, life or death scenes. There's fear, suspense, vengeance, a lot of other feelings. Um, and in these movies, it's okay to have violent criminals because they'll be caught in the end. So it kind of redeems itself. And we'll look at violence in a later class in the semester. And we feel like it's okay for the good guy to break the law in order to catch the bad guy. A crazy example of this, I don't know if any of you have ever seen this movie, it's just ridiculous. I'm gonna watch the trailer for it. They hunted him down. You know, Colonel, we went to a lot of trouble to find him. They murdered his friends. And they took the only thing he would kill for. If you want your kid back, then you gotta cooperate. Right? Wrong. Now, somewhere, somehow, someone's gonna pay. This movie is hilarious to watch because it's utterly ridiculous. How he kills the whole army with crazy things. And think about the Jackie Chan who's always beating people up with like his props. You're a funny guy, Sally. That's why I'm going to kill you last. Now you're going to tell me what's going on or what? No. Don't disturb my friend. He's dead tired. What are you doing? Helping you get her back. Remember, Sally, when I promised to kill you last? That's what I meant to do. I lied. <laughs> Yeah, he's, just, he's got a construction truck. Yeah, he just took over a car. A mission no man can survive. He's the man for the job. Arnold Schwarzenegger, commander. All right, moving on. A comedy, so minor conflicts flare up and set the action. Um, characters have unusual traits or quick wits. Happy at the end, everything is resolved. Sitcoms are well are well known by audiences. So The Office, um, or I think Office might fit the next one, Friends. And then a subgenre of comedy is a character comedy. It's humor comes from the character quirks that, that show the craziness of everyday situations. Um, the creator of this, Seinfeld, um, and certain social con uh, conventions are illustrated and they make us laugh. So we have Seinfeld, Big Bang Theory, and probably top comedy of all time if you have HBO, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Um, I'm going to show you this clip. I cannot show you a lot of the clips from Curb Your Enthusiasm because it's so bad. Some of the things are crazy uh, and unconventional. Um, but it's a very good show. This, the last season just ended, um, and it always ties in at the end. And we'll watch this clip here. Yeah, well, days I want sex, I'm a lot nicer. 
Really? Oh yeah, I'll be nice the whole day. And then we'll have sex. Then I'll just go back to being the way I am. It's fascinating. And it works for you. What is that banana thing? Have these people that come here, they get ten, ten samples, you know? And it's not right for the woman working back there. She's got better things to do than just pick out samples for them. Yeah, well, yeah. Like, what, what is this? Oh, chocolate. Look at this. People are waiting. That's not right. No, it's not. You know, I shouldn't be eating ice cream. No, you shouldn't. No, I really shouldn't. I don't know why they came. So these were the everyday situation, but the guy is if I stay quirky here, and he get gets himself involved. Right, get out. Got a long wait. Well, oh, can I try that tiramisu? It's good. That's a good one. That's a good one. Get that. Get that. I think I will. Yeah, get that. Thank you. Get that. And I think I'd yeah. like to try the banana, please. Banana? <laughs> it might taste like, let me guess, a banana? And some chocolate. I mean, this is just really ridiculous. This is so rude. Just the plain chocolate. You know, you're like a sample abuser. That's what you are. You? You're abusing your sampling privileges. What one sample, two samples the most. You can't just go on sample oh, yes. after yes, sample. Yes, I can. No, I you can. can't. You know what? I just can have to take vanilla, please. Oh, oh a decision's been made. Oh, we got vanilla. Enjoy. Thank you. Vanilla. She winds up with vanilla. You gotta be kidding me. That was the video. Um, yeah, so I, rec I really recommend that show. It's hilarious and it's on HBO, so it's uncensored. Um, the new season was hilarious. All right, any, anyway, moving on. So put downs, characters have power over others and use them in humorous ways. An example of this is Two and a Half Men. Uh, I don't really like that show anyway. Romance um, shows lack of romance and ba or bad relationships. Identify with the main character and feel their pain. We get closer and closer to the goal with hard work, heartbreaking setbacks used uh, until goal and love is obtained. I think the most popular example of this, which I showed, is a notebook or Sex in the City. Um, and these are the worst rom-coms of all time. Let's just go down this list a little bit. She's all that. Yeah, I think John Oliver just made fun of this movie in his one of his episodes where he said uh, it was very like machismo that the girl could only be better if she became more attractive. Um, let's see what some of the movies here. I don't even know any of these movies. Uh, yeah, we're gonna get out of here. I don't know what this is. These movies, they're that bad. Um, okay, so we think we know these formulas so well that we can write and produce our own films and shows, but while the formulas are simple, making them work is very difficult. And that's why the producers, the directors, and the studio heads get paid lots of money. They know how to do this. So, reality TV genre. It's the newest genre. Came out in 2000 with the most popular shows, Survivor, American Idol, and Big Brother. Um, did you guys, speaking of Big Brother, do you know what Big Brother is? It's basically the show where people are locked in a house for a certain amount of days and have to live with each other. Um, I haven't seen the clip, but you guys can check this out. Recently, the people got locked before the coronavirus scare. And when they got out of the show, it was a big thing alive and they found out that the world, imagine being locked away for like two months over how long it is and coming together, the pandemic is spreading, the people were crying and everything. Um, this is an unscripted series, supposedly unscripted. There's some debate about this. Um, I think some of them pay them for the action. Um, unscripted series using real people exploded. By 2010, there were 320 reality TV shows. I couldn't find how much today, but there's a lot. This was up from four in 2000. So in 2000, we had Survivor, American Idol, and Big Brother. I don't know what the other one was. These include lots of subgenres: the love and hip hop genre, the basketball wives, rich housewives of Atlanta, whatever subgenre, the dating shows. Netflix is even producing reality shows. I never would believe that. And when they started doing it, I thought it was gonna flop, but it's been very big. It's trending on social media and everybody's watching these shows. Um, when Survivor, we're gonna watch what Survivor is in case you don't know. It was really the first reality TV show. You are witnessing 
helping 16 Americans begin an adventure that will forever change their lives. 16 strangers forced to band together, carve out a new existence, totally accountable for their actions. They must learn to adapt or they're voted off. In the end, only one will remain and will leave the island with $1 million in cash as their reward. 39 days, 16 people, one survivor. I think Richard Hatch were, uh, won the first season. Basically, yeah, they're still stranded. They have to do tasks. They have to get water. They have to get food. If they win the task, they can get some food and some food. And whoever is, they vote people off. So, okay, the, the tribe voted this person off. They're the weakest link. They're annoying. And the winner got a million dollars. This is a game. But the game also reflects a lot on real life. All right, guys, you can watch that on your own time. Um, and the Survivor Islands have become a huge tourist destination. There's one in Malaysia. I passed on that. Um, so it takes a handful of people and puts them in competitive situations. Um, I don't know if you guys watch Real World Road Rules Challenges. They keep making those things. Um, one of my exes was addicted to it, so I saw a bunch of them. Um, and puts them in competitive situation, personalities revealed, and we identify with one or, or a couple of the characters. Um, oh, I identify, I forgot the guy's name in Real World Rules, he was whatever, and oh, I'm rooting for him. What are some of your favorite or worst reality shows of all time? I'm glad this clip is back. So, and making the band, uh, Puff Daddy, P Diddy, whatever his name is now, Diddy. Um, he's bringing back making the band where they would create a band and this was a huge show when I was in high school because they were doing a rap group and, and one of the most famous episodes, you know, they had all these artists, they had the R&B singer, the reggae guy, the rappers from New York and from Philadelphia and the South, whatever. He told them they have to walk to Brooklyn to get cheesecake from juniors. You get a vehicle home possibly, you could possibly, I'm starving too. You know something? I want me a piece of cheesecake. <laughs> so you know where to get the cheesecake spot is at, no? Yeah. Yeah. And y'all can walk from here, get the cheesecake, see the city, enjoy the sights, would you? Show them around. Look them over the Brooklyn Bridge, let that wind hit them off the water. See how y'all feel as a group. It's not about me trying to do a mean spirited initiation hazing act to them. It's a bigger picture to it. In the world of music, I gotta get up every day and do a bunch of stuff I don't wanna do. I gotta bite my tongue and I gotta do it with a smile on my face. <laughs> but I do want some cheesecake. So I'll see y'all in a little while. Take your time, enjoy it. And you ain't really got nothing else to do. <laughs> Fred, you all right? Fred, yeah, yeah. You all right? Fred, I'm good. This dude must be crazy. Sooner or later, we gonna clash. What? Yeah. My cheesecake. My cheesecake is in the least bit soft. A brittle or not on point, your will go back. Somebody gonna quit. Somebody ain't got the heart, the stamina to be bad. Well, somebody ain't got the passion, the drive. That uh, do you guys know Danny Kane? Somebody's mental capacity is placed at a certain point. Um, I need they to were, sit they down with this when I'm two million in. There's things in life that ain't gonna be fair, and this is one of them. Get your faces right. Yo, Frederick. I can see Miami's calling you. It's hot there. It's hot there. In Philly, you got a big. Now you ain't really that nice, neither. <laughs> He's not really that nice. You know what Junior is at? Yo, fam. Puffy just told us to go to the store in Brooklyn and bring him back a cheesecake and walk. Yeah. See me on TV. All right, let's fast forward. Diddy told them if they don't go, they're going to get off the show. They have to go back home. 
I start walking from Times Square to Brooklyn. That's deep. A lot of miles. So they finally get there and she drops it. you guys enjoyed that clip the show's coming back i don't know if i'll watch it though it depends <laughs> moving on to video games um more open than narratives there's a goal and rule for playing you get involved in the story you make progress to win the game you create narratives through the gameplay and it gives a sense of power um that we can change the story so they're simple games we have super mario as i showed you last class you have digital checkers of chess you have a uh, pool in the iPhone and you have uh, Pac-Man. It's super easy to use, you figure it out. And then there's games that are more involved. I don't know if you guys know about the Zelda game on the Switch, but that game is endless and it takes literally weeks and months to beat it. It's like a real world that you can go around and train and stuff. The Final Fantasy series, I used to be a big fan of this when I was a kid. Um, you need to train, you need to solve puzzles, and it takes weeks. You, li you literally have to just go around and fight random monsters to get your skills up. Same thing like Pokemon. The, not Pokemon Go, the regular one. All games share one thing in common. It's a digital code. They all have video, uh, sorry, audio and visual elements to attract audiences. Final Fantasy um, has such a big audience that what, and their soundtrack is so great that they ever actually have a touring orchestra to play just the background music and it gets sold out this is it. i would actually go to one of these things because i have such nostalgia from playing those games me and my cousin would spend weekends together taking turns trying to beat these games um, and then a lot of popular, sorry, when I jumped ahead, um, a lot of popular games have soundtracks. A lot of the NBA games, the NFL games, they have soundtracks to real songs. And here's a controversy that popped up recently with one of the games. As you all know, or don't know, Colin Kaepernick was taken. I don't know if he was taken off, but he, they didn't even know his contract. Uh, going into the NFL because he was kneeling in protest of police abuse. So Madden NFL 19, they had a song YG's Big Bank and it had a verse by Big Sean that said, I think, don't quote me in this, I'm more Colin than Kaepernick and they cut off that line. And he's, I don't think he's in the video game. Like you cannot choose him as a player. And there was a backlash. Big Sean said, I didn't okay this. YG said, I didn't okay this. They said it was a mistake. I don't think it was a mistake. And they changed it and fixed it. Um, games are highly attractive to niche audiences. Like all media, you know, we all know people who love games. We're going to see a crazy example in a bit. Uh, so the multiple media player online uh, role-playing game. It's a game where you play against lots of other people. The most popular is Warcraft. Um... And people are paying real money for virtual items. In a smaller scale, we all know people who are addicted to Candy Crush or whatever silly game is online, the phone now. And, you know, people who send you those requests on Facebook that you have to block them. Um, and they, those people sometimes pay to get upgrades and stuff. 
people have paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for virtual items in these games. Somebody paid 9,000 for a World of Warcraft uh, character, limited edition character. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead to the most expensive item. Somebody paid, this is not a joke, this is actual. They paid $635,000 to have an exclusive club in a game called uh, Entropia Universe, where it's just like a Sims kind of thing. That's ridiculous. Anyway, moving on. When producers make games, they have three important decisions to make. The category of play, the formality of play, and the effective tone. So the category of play, there's six types, six options. We have the competition games. We can think about Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, where you fight against one another, or you fight against the computer. We have the winning odds, roulette, poker, etc. We have Mimicry, where you're, where you're getting a new identity. So Sims, um, and that game that I showed you where they paid a lot of money for. We have Vertigo, where you change your perceptual system. So you guys know in the arcade or in the malls, they have that weird like moving box thing and you put on a headset and it's a roller coaster simulator. You one of those. Exploration, you explore new worlds. So Final Fantasy Sim um Zelda. Social, contact others and make groups, Call of Duty, Fortnite things like that. And most games usually combine two or more features. So the formality of play are the rules. Some games have little rules. Grand Theft Auto is open-ended. You could attack anybody. You could get weapons. You could steal a car. You can drive into the ocean, things like that. Other games have lots of rules, such as Mario. There's lots of rules. You can only go straight forward in the old Mario, not the new one. Um, tone, what do we feel when we interact with the game? Do we feel aggression? Do I feel suspense as the fighter? So popular game for me growing up was Resident Evil. Uh, give me one second, guys. Uh, All right, so one of the games that was big when I was a kid was Resident Evil, and as corny and low-grade as the graphics are, uh, me and my cousins would sit around and watch each other play, or my uncle play, and get scared. We would put the light off and just watch the, uh, watch the, the game play. stay in the hall in case of an emergency so they reworked these games they came out with new ones and those are really scary chris take care I just want to show you the scene when the zombie comes out. All right, might have to fast forward. Yeah, so at the time, right now it looks cheesy and corny, but at the time it was groundbreaking. Um, all right, let's move on. Um, besides these three, there are six rules producers use for repeated exposures and allow us to play new games or versions of the same game. One of the ways they do is reward players, uh, only the good ones. If you suck at a game, you're not going to get the item or move up. The game has to be easy to learn. It can be difficult at the end, but it has to be little by little. 
it's predictable. You use logical rules to predict the outcome of actions. Obviously, in the zombie game, Resident Evil, I have to kill the zombie or it's going to kill me. Consistent, same, same outcomes of, of actions. Has to be familiar and it has to be challenging. If not, if it's not challenging, players are going to leave uh, interest fairly quickly. So think about Mario. You can get through the first few levels and then it gets harder and harder. Uh, so what happens when we play these games? So good games give us two types of feelings. One is called flow and the other is called telescoping. Flow. It's when we get so lost in the task of the game, um, we get so lost of it in real life. In order for this to happen, you must be so lost that the person loses all track of time and place. You feel like you are in the game. We all know people like this. They're up all night, they lose sense of the real world, they don't eat, they don't shower, um, they're thirsty, they don't even get up. Um, they're so in tune with the next goal inside the game, the real world, and everything else is forgotten. Another way is telescoping. It's the way players focus on steps within the game to proceed. Immediate goals in the foreground and future objectives in the background. So it's a big picture in mind as you proceed. It doesn't stop uh, playing after the medium objective. You look for more. So example, in the Resident Evil game, my main goal and objective is to get out of that evil house. My first goal is to kill that zombie. So I need to get more weapons. I need to figure out how to get out of here. I need to figure out what's going on. So talented gamers have mastered the ability to keep all these varied objectives alive in their heads simultaneously. And telescoping is not the same as multitasking. Multitasking is doing different things at once. Telescoping is a sequence of ordered objectives. So when you have flow and telescoping together, it can be so rewarding that your brain, um, it feels like it's a drug. And it keeps bringing back players for more, people who are addicted to video games. Um, and they want to get back to the game as quickly as possible. They don't want to go out. They don't want to go to the gathering. They just want to be home all night playing a video game. Here's the perfect example. I enjoy gaming more than I enjoy life. Gaming is simple and rewarding. People care about me there more than in the real world. And I'm good at it. I've had a lot of opportunities to succeed in the real world but i pass them up and i feel like it's kind of hopeless now in the back of my head i can notice my life is degrading it just makes me want to play more because then i don't have to think about it as much a day in the life for me i generally wake up at 4 p.m because i was up all night gaming the night before i'll probably eat once a day just to get it over with i don't get as hungry when i'm gaming my body goes to the wayside I'll only get up to go to the bathroom. I pretty much will game until I have to go to sleep, maybe even 24 hours. And even then I'll still try and stay up a little bit longer. And then just repeat the same process all over again. Game all day until the sun comes up, all night. If I do have weed, I'll smoke it pretty much all day, every day. You get more immersed into the game when you're high. When I first started playing, it was always male characters. But as I- All right, and as you guys can watch the video yourself, and I guess, I don't know, I would call this person a loser, but nowadays these video game players can make lots of money. If you guys know who Ninja is, he's a star Fortnite player. He was playing with Drake, Travis Scott, and he makes millions of dollars. Esports is becoming ever popular, so I think there's a valid, there's a, there's a, 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 real, a real crime. So another type of genre are the interactive message platforms. Producers create structures that allow individuals to create their own messages and send to audiences or to the general public. They try to attract certain users for the niche. Um, and these producers tailor service on the platform that allows the best opportunities to communicate goals. Two types, the social contact and sharing. So SNS, social network uh, structure, is a social web platform that allows users to create public profiles, make connections with visitors to the site, and share personal information. Users can build their sites with text, photos, video, etc. Provide easy access through mobile, give a sense of community, 
when we talk about community on these platforms, we're talking about more psychological than, ge than geographic. Obviously, we have a lot of friends or family that live in different places that are not immediately close by to us, but in our minds, they're close by in the app. And we can interact with anyone in the world. Um, I have friends from traveling and they're on Facebook and Instagram. Um, the first uh, site of this, the first type of site was called sixdegrees.com. It was started in 1997. Unfortunately, it no longer exists anymore. Um, but this is what it looked like when you tried to log on. Um, then uh, by 2003, I had exploded MySpace, Facebook, and others. Uh, sorry, guys, give me a second. I need to get my plug to charge my computer. Um, people on these sites want three things. Friendship, dating, or to live somewhere else. And sometimes it's a mixture of all three. I've mentioned this website to you a few times in class. This is couch surfing. So basically, I know it sounds really weird. It's a website where if you're traveling to another place and you're a budget traveler, you can stay with other people. I've used this site and it works really well based on reviews. So you're not gonna stay with somebody who has no reviews, who has no photos. Um, so I stood with somebody in Peru. I wrote them a review, blah, blah, blah. They wrote me a review. People know that I'm respectful, clean, or whatever. Sometimes people get bad reviews. Um, they have a hangout feature. You can't, I can't show you guys here, but on the app on the phone, if I'm in a city, you can do that. Last time I went to Bangkok and I hung out with a bunch of people. We did it in Colombia, in Medellin. And lately, the, this app is getting crazy with a lot of guys looking for girls. Um, even some of the meetups, people want to hang out because they're alone and it comes into dating at the end of the night. Everybody's breaking off into groups. Um, so it combines all three. People want to date on here. People want to live somewhere else for free. And people want friendship. I encourage you guys to take advantage of this, but be very careful. Um, here's breaking them up into each category. Friendship. Some sites help you make new friends and others to maintain the friends you have. Most popular of that of those sites is Facebook. In 2004, Mark Zuckerberg launched Facebook. It was first only for Harvard students. There's some critique on this, um, some discussion that he started the site to rank girls in his dorm room and at Harvard. Uh, you can watch the movie. And then it expanded to Boston area, then to Ivy League. I got Facebook in like 2006 or seven, and you could only log in if you had a .edu email. Not everyone has it. Everybody in the world. My grandmothers and grandparents all over the world have it. I mean, while we can use these sites to take friendships to the next level, such as dating, they aren't really meant for that. They're just meant to maintain friendships and social relationships. Sometimes people do. Sometimes I've heard stories of friends that I know, like, oh, I connected with my middle school sweetheart or a girl from high school I had, cr had a crush with. And, you know, but it's not really meant for that. Although Facebook does have a dating app now. Specifically dating the social networking sites. It's Tinders and other sites that use your GPS location to find potential lovers nearby. Hinge, Tinder, Grinder, Bumble, I don't know what, what else they have. Plenty of fish. Um, and lately with the coronavirus, there's been a surge on these apps. People can't go out to bars anymore. They can only turn to the apps. Um, where's the stat I'm looking for? From March 12th to March 22nd, Bumble recorded a 21% increase in sent messages in Seattle, 23% increase in New York City, and 26% increase in San Francisco. Um, some other websites in this uh, article also mentioned that Bumble is imploring people and putting a lot of information to be careful about who you date. There's no point in staying home if you're just going to go hook up and meet a random person. So they're Tell people to be careful and stay home. But use the app to connect with somebody when the world gets back to what it should be going to date. So living, these are sites. Some people want virtual friendship sites where they use the avatar and explore, the Sims. The most popular of these sites was called Second Life. I think it still exists, but the users have gone down. It had 1 million daily users and 33 million registered users in 2013. Here's what it looked like.
Looks like he got he had Yeezys on. Maybe that's where Kanye got the idea from. And these are two completely random people who knows in the world dating together on the online platform. I don't see the appeal in this, but it was very popular. And these are real things you can do. You can go shopping, buy homes, customize wigs, whatever. All right, you can watch the rest of the clip on your own time. Let's move on, we're almost done. So another type of genre is sharing. It allows you to share information, share music, share videos, and share opinions. Uh, most popular way is through blogs, also known as web blogs. Users post their personal opinions and invite you to read it. Um, they have textual elements such as uh, diary notations, hobbies, quotes, lists, visual and graphic elements, photos, videos, web links, and interactive elements. You can post comments, you can email the author, and things like that. So blogs offer an unlimited audience, freedom of content, freedom of size of article, and post thought and, ex and expect reactions. So as opposed to writing in a magazine or a newspaper, you can write whatever you want. You can write how, as much as you want and, and whatever. Blogs kind of went wayside after Instagram and YouTube exploded. Now we have vlogs. So they're just people talking about their experience instead of writing about it. I've used this a lot when traveling. Blogs are very good because the traditional websites are not working and writing about these very niche things. Sorry, let me go back and open this link for you. One good example. Um, so one thing when you when you travel budget when you budget travel for long term, you have more time than money. What does that mean? Um, I need to go from the top of Mexico to the bottom of Mexico. I can fly for two hundred dollars, or I can take the bus. For 50. Um, that's just an example. I don't think you could do that. You need multiple buses anyway. So this blog showed me I was in Nicaragua. I wanted to go to these beautiful islands. The flight was gonna be like two hundred dollars, but using this website and their step-by-step -step instructions, I was able to take an all-day bus, an all-night ferry, and a speedboat to get there for like 20 bucks. So information, informational and education websites that allow you to just participate in an interactive manner. These are called wikis. We all know wikis. Um, a wiki is a website that allows you just to add a material, to edit, and even delete content. It was first designed in 1994 by Walter Cunningham. Popular one, not so much anymore, is the Game of Thrones wiki, where it would tie in concepts from the books to the, to the show. And if you wanted to know who's that character, how does the book differentiate from the show? You can spend, I used to spend hours reading this and my friends and, and conversing about it after watching the show on HBO on Sundays. Sorry about that. Let me go back. Obviously the most famous uh, wiki site is Wikipedia. It started in 2001. Um, sorry, I went back too much. As a free encyclopedia. When Wikipedia came out, it struggled to get people to use the website. Why am I going to build content for this person for free? Why am I going to add information? But it, it quickly grew on. By 2014, it had 4 million articles. But what's the problem with Wikipedia and any type of wiki? Anyone can edit and add information. This is dangerous. There's moderators that check, but things can go up and change pretty quickly. How do we tell what's real? They have to be annotated. I tell my students all the time, you cannot cite Wikipedia as a source, but if you go to Wikipedia, get those numbers, go down to the bottom and verify those are real news sources, use the new source. Um, but you have to verify that. So the you guys, as a class collectively, could write a Wikipedia on me and say a lot of harmful and mean things that don't actually exist. This has happened a lot. Um, these are the biggest hacks in Wikipedia. People have gone in. So this is a funny one, and I forgot what year this was. Drake was beefing with Common uh, because they had both dated Serena Williams or something like that. And one of Common's diss songs, he called Drake uh, as a reference to the ginger ale. He called them Canada Dry. So somebody went on the Canada Dry Wikipedia page and added Drake's photo.
somebody put in Osama bin Laden's page. He was a chronic masturbator. Um, let's see what other ones. Um, for the Wikipedia entry for Batman, they just put they just typed out the theme song. I'm not gonna sing it. Let's see what's the first one. If we can ever get to it. Um, I don't get this one. Okay. Yeah, saying people had died when they didn't really die. Um, they've done that a lot. I think in rap terms, when they had, I think Meek Mill, when Meek Mill was beefing with Drake and he put out that song that sort of killed his career, they went on Meek Mill's Wikipedia page and put like the death date. So the content belongs to the community and not Wikipedia. Errors can be corrected or seen quickly by a lot of users. So people pick this up and they change it. So music, music sharing. The sharing of music was started in 1999 when Napster was created by Sean Fanning. Within a year, with, uh, within a year over, there were 70 million downloads. You could share copies of audio on your computer. You could download any recorded music for free. There was a big problem with this. The recording industry of America sued Napster, said it allowed for piracy of copyrighted music. You cannot freely share music. Um, when you buy a CD, it has a warning to not share this, tapes, anything. Um, and most famous for this was Metallica. They sued Napster 15 years ago. Why? They had a new album. They hadn't put an album out for years. It leaked on uh, Napster and people were sharing it. So another crazy example is a 12-year-old girl was sued by the record industry for millions of dollars. Um, she agreed to pay, they settled, and they agreed to pay $2,000 or about $2 uh, per song. So how did this work and how was it supposed to work? When you went on Napster, let's say I have the, the Drake CD, right, and I have it on my computer. They can share, but you have to disable sharing. A lot of people didn't realize you had to disable sharing, and they shared. When you share music, you're violating the copyright. As long as you download and don't share, you are okay. Um, and I think in, in, the most, in the more infamous situation, a Bronx man was sued because he unmistakably uploaded a version of Batman or some movie and had to pay millions of dollars. That 12 year old girl example, the 12 year old girl uh, story was, was the, music, the music industry, the studios, the labels, trying to scare everybody to stop doing this. I remember when that came out, my mom was like, we better not be sharing music. I'm not going to pay all this money if they sue us, blah, blah, blah. Um, and eventually Napster was shut down, although it's back now as a sort of Spotify thing. Um, but so many came, so many things came up after. LimeWire, BearShare, Kazaa. You cannot stop the illegal sharing of anything digital. There's ways around it. They will. I asked my friend who works in music and who works kind of in the music industry and they said, there's no way you can stop it. All those file sharing sites are shut down. I used to have one on one of my phones where I could just download new songs straight to my phone. That shut down. Um, they keep going after them. But now you can just Google. If you just Google any album, try this out. Don't download it. I want you guys to get in trouble. But um, what's the album? If you put the weekend, the new weekend album, and you put album free zip, you'll find it. You can also do a thing called the YouTube Ripper. A YouTube ripper is basically, it takes the audio from the YouTube and compresses it into an MP3 file. Um, I do this. There's a certain artist that I like who puts out these long mixtapes, but um, it's only on SoundCloud. So I want to hear it offline when I'm on the plane or when I'm riding my bike and I don't have service. So I've used this to download those uh, mixtapes. And certain times, songs are pulled from YouTube and uploaded. So one of the songs that I use, that I, one of my favorite songs of all time is Drake, Dreams Money Can Buy. And it was a song that was supposed to be on his Take Care album, but it didn't. And so every time you would go on YouTube, try to listen to it, they would shut it down. So you would hear a version of it with the wrong pitch. Either it was too fast, it was too slow, his, his song voice sounded off. 
thankfully, thank you, Drake. He released a, a lot of his like odd singles on an album two years ago, a year ago. <sighs> Moving on. So video. It's where you upload and share videos. YouTube is obviously the most popular. The first video uh, from YouTube was me at the zoo. This is it. That's the first YouTube video by the creators. It was released in 2005, so not even 15 years ago. YouTube, uh, look how fast it exploded. Uh, a year later, on October 9th, um, it was announced that YouTube would be purchased by Google for $1.65 billion. And YouTube has tons of followers. Um, one of the things I was told as a reporter in one of the workshops that I attended was to use YouTube as a search function. There's so much information being uploaded to YouTube every day. Um, there is a lot of stuff on there. Mm, in May 2010, YouTube had 2 billion views a day. 2012, first presidential debates. Um, um, what else? The platform has 1.9 billion logged in monthly users, blah, blah, blah. Lots of content uploaded every day, every hour, every minute on YouTube. So now that we know all the genres and so forth, how do we increase our media literacy? So by understand, just by understanding how these formulas and genres work, we've already increased our media literacy. We know the next step reality formula, um, which is the most popular, so we can ID if the messages are real or fantasy and also how the two are combined. Maybe this love story seems possible, but um, come on. Um, thinking about the Jayla movie where her shoe comes off, and the dumpster tries to run her over and she finds the love of her life. That's probably not going to happen. Um, from this formula, all the, other genre, all the other formulas come out. It's like a tree in its branches. So we need to look at patterns in the media messages with those in the real world. Do they match up? So don't make fantasy your expectation for how you live. I think we talked about this in class, the Hamptons lifestyle. Um, I'm not going to modify my car like Fast and Furious. Although I know people who have done this with the tints, the spoilers on cars that base, sorry, I shouldn't say basic, but entry level cars that shouldn't have these things, such as Nissans, like Nissan Vert, like Nissan Altima or Honda Civics. Honda Civics could. And we all know people that do this. They're living the fantasy expectation, especially that hip hop, rap, or fan life. They're spending lots of money on fancy Gucci belts. Jordans and all these things to try to emulate the fantasy element of social media of of um, media that they that they want but they can't really afford. And we need to be skeptical and ask ourselves questions. Be active during their exposure. Um, don't fold the fake media expectation. Um, I've linked this article in the links page on Blackboard, which basically talks about how movies have always given us this one true love idea, which is false because a lot of people wind up staying with somebody who treats them bad and is not for them because they think, okay, we'll get through the bad and you'll be my one true love, which is completely false and detrimental to yourself. Um, with news, we need to check things that aren't given to us. We need to look closer at where the articles are coming from and from different viewpoints. If something seems off, we need to look at sites and outlets, Google the links. Um, what are your needs for media exposure? Beware of extra exposures. So the biggest manipulation of ads is in prescription drugs. In 2008, each person was exposed to 16 hours of prescription ads. They're often misleading and make you worry about something you don't have to. Do you have this random d disease? Um, they use emotional appeal, social approval, and regain control in your life with the meds. Um, I've seen one I bought like gas, but you know, and they always have these like crazy side symptoms that are worse than the actual supposed disease. They make you want to run to the doctor and ask for these prescriptions. And here's a spoof from NFL. I mean, from SNL. You know, when I hit 50, my body went through a big change and not for the better. Severe erectile dysfunction shattered my confidence, sent me into a depression, and almost ruined my marriage. And believe me, I tried everything. But then a friend told me about Zentrax, so I tried it. 
and it worked. Zentrex is the strongest male enhancement drug on the market. It increases blood flow, boosts testosterone, and ends erectile dysfunction instantly. So I asked my doctor about Zentrex, and he said, Zentrex? What the hell is Zentrex? And I said, Zentrex. It's the strongest male enhancement drug in the world, and it works. And he said he'd never heard of it. So I pulled up the Zentrex website and showed it to him. He started laughing. He said, are you insane, man? You can't put that junk in your body. It'll kill you. Your heart will stop. Rhino horn. Ammonia hydroxide? That's what's in meth, right? Zentrex is made strong enough to work on the most extreme cases of erectile dysfunction. And fast. My doctor asked me, where'd you even hear about that I told him, a friend. And he said, well, what's his name? And I said, well, I don't really know him, actually. And he says, but you just said he's your friend. So I told my doctor, look, let's just forget about him and just write me a script for Zentrex and I'll be on my way. My doctor said, are you deaf, man? No, I could lose my license. You could die. I said, yeah, I think I still want it, though, so give it to me. Write the prescription. I wasn't leaving. So he says, I think that website just froze my computer. So I grabbed him. And he goes, you're hurting me, sir. <laughs> Zentrex works. Side effects for Zentrex. Rage, acne, bleeding, baldness, blindness, pooping cough, hallucinations, coma, trouble swallowing, decrease in semen, increase in semen, nasal sores, constipation, vomiting, night terrors, amnesia, and suicidal urges. And those are just the side effects I tell you about. I get the sweats, my bones are cold, my teeth are loose, my heart gets really, really hot. I can read minds. And sometimes I'll wake up driving a stolen car. My erections are fantastic. When I wear gray sweatpants, people cross the street, which is fine. Zentrex gave me my life back. Hail Satan. So threaten your doctor or ask your ketamine guy about South African Zentrex today. <laughs> it works. Sorry, guys. This is getting in the way. Um, when we look at video games, we have to be aware of addiction. Are people running away from their real lives by running to play video games? I think some people are. Um, like all media, whatever you consume, it should enrich, enrich your life and not govern your life. Such as uh, one big example of this, you go out to dinner with your family or friends or even on a date and the person is on Instagram because they need to stay updated on everything. All right, okay class. Um, I'm gonna pull up the example for next class. So I don't know if I can find it, um, has to do with the ASMR. All right, I look forward to your responses.